for coming out. We'll get you started here because it's already 3.30. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So um, I have very much over-prepared stuff. There's times where I talk to high schools and things, and I'll sometimes build a slideshow to show them. So I'm very comfortable moving forward, moving back. Plus, I'm very forgetful, so I'll skip past slides anyway. But um, today, I'd, I'd kind of like to cater to kind of some things you're interested in. Um, we have some seasoned videographers and people in this room here. So we may talk a little tech, but we also have some people who are just generally interested about getting into documentary filmmaking, journalism, those kind of things. So once we get started here with some behind the scenes footage that we all kind of can laugh at and take a look at, I'll just kind of ask for some questions and just kind of see where we want to go from there. So, um, so first of all, uh, we have been working on a series of videos called A Walk in My Shoes for the last three years. Uh, from the time I got here, there was a number of small requests to make stories and occasionally just recordings of people's interviews. But the first time we did this was literally three years ago with one of our professors, uh, Dr. Taylor. And we'll get back to that in a second. Oh. There we go. Okay. I told you I'm very forgetful. Okay. Um, but she at the time wanted to do a series of videos on our international students with the idea that we had all these international students who'd come here with their families from as far away as Afghanistan, from uh, Indonesia, all over the place, who were experiencing things in the College of Education that most of our uh, blonde hair, blue-eyed girls from Kansas were not experiencing in the College of Ed. And the idea was if we could get to know more about them, film a little story about them, that within the College of Education, we wouldn't necessarily educate people, but we would kind of open people's eyes to what it is like to be an international student. And so that was a very simple project. We did, I think, six stories back then. And that's all it was. There was no intro. It was just, here's these six stories, about five minutes in length. And essentially what started that process was to go out there and film where they were at, film them at home, at work, uh, and mostly just on campus. But over time, that developed into this idea of what if we did different groups of students each year. And so last year, we did another series on military families. And that one, to be honest, I felt like I was very much way over my head on most of the topics. So we worked with a gal named Sandy Risberg, who had been in the military her entire life. And she basically fed the topics to me. She said, here's an issue we want to discuss. And she got the people together. So I pretty much acted as the role of a producer where I, I take the content that you give me, we build it, we kind of work on it together. And this year was a little different in that the dean had been, uh, I think it was at a, some banquet thing, and people were feeding her all kinds of ideas of what should be the next topic. And Patrice Scott, our communications director, had come to her one day, and she'd been gathering some facts. I think a lot of that came from Mary, I think, for the numbers, maybe not. Okay, we gathered some numbers somewhere. Oh, excuse me, CSPS. <laughs> so they gathered these numbers together because they were curious for a newsletter, what were some things we could say about our college? And one of those numbers that came out was that we were 37% uh, first generation within the College of Education. And then going through it, there were some other colleges who were reporting information. And I think at some point, correct me if I'm wrong here, Steve, at some point we came back to some numbers where our incoming freshmen were self-reporting that they were somewhere around 40% uh, first-generation students on campus, which we found out was twice the national average. So throughout this whole process, it started with a very simple question of, you know, why? Why do we have so many first-generation questions? And to be honest, if you saw the film, I don't know that we ever really answered that question. We just, we tackled this point of view of what was it like to be a first-generation student? And so, for me, as someone who's slowly starting to say I'm more of a documentary guy or I'm interested in documentaries, I think sometimes this whole idea of why do we make films is we're trying to answer questions, you know. And in this question, what is it like to be a first-generation student? Okay. So I'm going to go back a little bit here. Um, what was kind of advertised is that we would see some behind-the-scenes footage. And I think a lot of people thought we were going to see stuff like flying planes over the top of cars. It's not nearly as grand as that. So. We're going to go out and play a couple video clips here, and then we'll get back into some processes as to how we made this film.
our first cities was in Garden City. And while we're filming alone, really the best way to do two camera perspectives was to put something we could just put somewhere in the car like a GoPro camera. You'll see a clip of it here in a second, but essentially this little mount here, this is what held our camera 90% of the time on the inside or the outside of the car. Just two suction cups. That's it. My idea that that's what I wanted to do. So yeah. it's gonna be nice to hear. Well, that's good. It's very I don't know if I should keep driving around as often. Yeah, let's keep on driving. Okay. I guess I'll just make loops or what? Do I go to the front? Let's let's go ahead and head on over to the other school. We can okay. talk about this way of driving. I can go to the front of the school and then I'll pull because my elementary school is literally right. Jailroom. Jailroom. You oh, see the reflection the of the light in the top is. corner? I can pass by jail that's, that's a bad thing, by the way. You shouldn't see that. Whenever you're ready. Just where I'm from. Why don't you say, uh, say hi, my name is, and I am, you could say something like I'm the proud parent of. That's easy. That'll get me comfortable on the count. <laughs> hi, my name is Kim Leichter, and I am the proud parent of Jessica Leichter. And I live in Shawnee, Kansas. Beautiful. That was beautiful. Wow. Ah, wow. Ah. Movie star. You're a pro. <laughs> She'd been on camera before a couple times and was petrified because she didn't like how she looked last time. So it took all three of us talking her into it and saying, all you have to do is say how wonderful your daughter is. All you have to do is smile. And that's what worked. So did you say inside the car you had DSLR and outside you used the GoPro? It just depended on what situation it was. When they were driving and we wanted to hear them, it was DSLR with a wireless mic. This, this house here, I would walk from Washington and come over across here. This house here was uh, the Reed family. They were an African-American family. Mrs. Reed and Mr. Al Reed, they owned a car detail business right here. I used to cut through their yard every day as a young man to get to, to the zoo to meet my buddies and stuff at the swimming pool. And I remember one day Mr. Reed yelling at me, hey boy. Why are you cutting through my yard? Well, he started putting me to work. And uh, for a quarter, I would dump this trash. And eventually, I, I was about 10 at the time, and he has photos of me pushing a lawnmower, not from the top bar, but from the lower bar. And I used to mow the lawn for him, and he used to have a hedge right here, and I had to trim his hedges all the time. And then he passed away. And so I would come and take care of Mrs. Reed and do the yard and the upkeep and things. Uh, I would come see her when I was off at college, come home and come see her for Christmas and things. And she passed away and she, uh, she actually left me in her will. Really? Yeah. It was, uh, she was a really good woman. Yes. Hope this makes sense. You guys ever been filming somewhere or you wanted to film somewhere and suddenly it's, it's an incredible space and you weren't planning on filming it so now you're like pulling out the cameras, pulling out the gear and you've only got five minutes to film in a location. So here's four or five different shots to get one shot of Chuck in the chapel looking reverent if you will. And as you know the first time's not good so maybe the fifth time you'll get lucky. You tried, yeah. <laughs> a little glide cam. You guys have heard of those? It's, it's basically, it's a manual stick with the legs on the top and the bottom that has a little gimbal in it. So if you hold it right, it will get it nice and smooth, but... This isn't the First Baptist Church in downtown Kansas City, Kansas. It's down by the cemetery down there. Okay, thank you, Chuck. This is great. So 
again, just same shot, just trying to work out the framing to try to see which one I want I like best. And of course, you'll end up using one of those shots. <laughs> so the story behind this, we were gonna film her and do an interview down by the lake, but it's blowing about 30 miles an hour. And we start walking out on the beach and we're completely up to our ankles in mud. So we decide, you know what? This is still good. And right here, she tells a story of being a little girl coming back here to write in her journal as a little girl. So we were able to ask her that question later on and get it right on camera or good on audio. But for the sake of B-roll, we could still get the footage we needed to get from that. Okay. So that's really all the B-roll we have of behind the scenes stuff right there. But do you guys have any questions about that? How we try to get a shot or what was the purpose behind it? Simple yeah. question, Rusty. I yeah. mean, how much, how much uh, film do you have that goes into that hour, you know, final product? Like how many hours do you shoot to get down to one hour? Sure. So it's the interviews that are the killer. We had 16 hours of interviews which actually by a ratio wasn't that bad because we had 16 people in the film. So at most 45 minutes to an hour per person, but then you whittle that down. And it's not terribly hard, but it's compounded by you have multiple cameras shooting that same interview 16 times, if that makes sense. So you have, well, 32 to 48 hours of actual footage, but you sync those up and work through right there. The actual B-roll footage of, you know, just pretty stuff you see on the outside, not as bad as you might think, maybe six hours, eight hours of footage from that. But as that stuff's coming in, you kind of start keywording that and coding it. So if you kind of come in saying, I want this much footage and you know what you're after, it seems like a monumental amount, but it's actually not too That's bad. About normal ratio for an hour long documentary? Probably depends a lot, it seems like. Yeah. Is that for your experience? You guys tell me. <laughs> How about for like a five minute piece? Is it like three to one of actual footage? That's not possible. To make a five minute piece, you wouldn't come back with just 15 minutes of footage. You'd have, all right. We, we, we have no idea. We were just right. <laughs> I'll typically tell people for 100 hours of recorded footage, we'll use about one minute. Yeah. It really depends on the project there, because. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, yeah that's, sure. that's how we just like to say. Yeah. Have people say wow. <laughs> so I guess I had a question on the B-roll. Uh -huh. It has to do with more than the end production of it. So the, you had lots of great instances, I thought, where um, someone was doing a voiceover. Mm -hmm. And then, so you, you're filling up the voiceover with, in essence, B-roll. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, well, how did you get that? Because you had some great shots of like, you know, this was real important to me because it was a really, it was a turning point in my life. Right as the guy's turning his head, I'm like, oh, that was a great shot. Uh -huh. Did you like... Um, come up with it or did you listen to everything and be like yeah. okay you know what we should get you that shot of this? good question so about half the time we'd interview them beforehand and we had the luxury of having time between the first interview and going back to get it the three adults we didn't have that time so what we did when we took off is we said we we had a pre-interview over the phone we never went deep emotionally but we'd ask them lots of questions like hey i've heard martin that uh, you had this great person who helped you out through college he'd start to go into the story and and Part of what you're doing as a storyteller is you don't want them to get, not everybody cries, okay, but you don't want them to get too emotionally based because then they'll tell you the best story and then it's done. It's, it's like it's been leaked out. So you do this pre-interview where you try and find out instances and they say, you know what, I ought to take you to this school. So Chuck, the pastor guy, he, took, he told me about the school before we got there and then we just got lucky enough to get there and film that weekend to see it. But half the time it was pre-planned sequences. The other half we had weeks and even a month or two between the interview and then going back and finding the pieces for it. Yeah, yeah. So that brings up a good question here. We'll actually talk about that as a talking point is, one of the things I'm trying to get better at as far as visualizing is, it's easy to do the, what I call like the fridge look, where you know, you're making a sandwich and you need bologna. So get bologna, put on sandwich, done. And I hate doing that where it's B-roll where someone's talking and they say, you know my dad. You're like, dad, and show dad. You're, you're trying to show a, a sequence of images that if the audio was off, it could still tell a story. And so I'm not certainly not a pro at that, but we're trying to work where we can build a sequence of images that build us to a point emotionally or help us tell that story that audio couldn't do justice to by itself. So 
I'm going cool. away from pure data to emotion as mm -hmm. well as information. Yeah, we're trying anyway. Yeah. We're trying to. So. So just some basic talking points here. Um, part of this whole process for us is that this was not a rusty project by any means. This was a huge collaborative effort. Now that we're on our third year of doing this, we actually had an advisory committee. Well, we call it an advisory board, but the dean appointed one person to be, you know, this is kind of the main point person. In this case, it was Sandra here. Thanks, Sandra. And uh, we then had a group of up to nine people, including Mary and others, who were there throughout the entire process saying, you know what? Wouldn't it be great to have someone from rural country? Wouldn't it be great to have someone from western, southwestern Kansas? Because we just don't have that voice. And so throughout that whole process, we're constantly gathering new data going into it. And even before we begin any production at all, it was about a two-month wait, meet, wait, meet, talk, pre-interview before we begin producing anything. So um, again, without getting too technical, we'll talk basically about some early pre-production stuff. And as if we have time, we'll talk basically about this idea of planning and executing shots and then how we edit it in layers to build a story. So, Okay, go back here just a little bit. When I talk about finding a story worth telling, um, we're very lucky in the College of Education because they've had video services for a long time. And over the years, people have had stories that have had in mind saying, we're doing this great program. Wouldn't it be great if we could tell the story of the Pasitos program? Could we tell the story of Excel program? And so people have been waiting, I think, for some time to, to visually tell some of these stories. And so it's not really a question of do we have a story good enough to tell? It's more like can we gather the, the stuff we need to do justice to that story? Does that make sense? Okay. And I think having been on campus for just this little bit of time, I've seen, I've seen a lot of folks who've been in buildings for years and years and you go and talk to them, and you look around, and we have these phenomenal old castles here on campus where you're like, man, there's got to be a story about that. Um, I was over here in the, uh, what's your building right next to us, Mary? Not Holton, uh, Psychology? Dickens? Dickens, yeah, yeah. So I was walking up that creaky old floor, if you guys have been up there. You don't dare carry a camera because you're going to fall over going up the steps. But I went into a professor who's been in that room for 30 years in the same room. His tile's fallen down. He's looking out the window. And I said, man, how long have you been here? He says, 30 years. I said, wow. And this is like perfect ghost story space. This is like kind of creepy falling apart office thing. But he says, oh, I got lots of stories about this place. And so there's just there's hidden gems of all kinds of things out there that are worthy of telling. And when you begin to see that, and as you begin thinking visually of how can I tell a story, man, I want to film that. I want to film those creaky steps. I want to think about how can I get this cool spiral shot going down, following a student, if I didn't fall over doing it kind of thing. So it's fun stuff. Again, for us, the question came down to is, what was it like being a first-generation student? For our advisory board that was together with this, we came up with this idea originally of having six people, and then we expanded it by saying we need to have five students who are currently here, three adults, we had no names as of yet. We just said, where do we want them to come from? And so something I credit the dean for in the college is we're, I think we're pretty colorblind. We, we don't, conversations being very blunt here, don't typically surround saying, boy, wouldn't it be great to have a black kid in the video? Shouldn't we have a Chinese kid? It's very much where are these people coming from and what stories could we tell? And so we knew we wanted to have people coming from the city that could come from anywhere, Wichita for all we care. We wanted people coming from the country. The one thing we never really did find is we were hoping to find somebody out on a farm. I, I really had a strong feeling I wanted to go out there and see the kid on the tractor, work in the field, coming home at night and talking with mom and dad. We never found that story, but we did find two other people from the country who had similar experiences growing up. And then we kind of let the committee go to work. CSPS did a phenomenal job of going through and saying, who do we know that's first generation? And they kind of looked at the books, kind of said, here's some people we know. I think, Sandra, you're the one that sent out the original email. Yeah, what, what did the email look like? What did that? Um, I just said we were thinking about doing a video on first generation students. You identified yourself as one. Would you be interested? And then I just kind of let them email back. And then we kind of went from there. So yeah. We had several, and then just time wise, some people fell out just because of that or got a little scared to be on camera. But yeah. What was, what was Chris's response? What did you say? I'll do the thing wrong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> good, good. So this was the master plan. We're going to find these people from these places, 
And eventually names were recommended. Um, we started highlighting where they're from and we did some pre-interviews early on. Out in western Kansas, because it's so far away, we at one time were going to go down and interview someone in lib liberal Kansas, but now we're talking five hours away. And it finally came down to who could be there when I was going to go out to western Kansas. Okay, just a comment about discovery, and again, I hope this connects to everybody here. People sometimes ask, you know, how do you, how do you go about, when you've gotten that interview, or even as you're preparing for an interview, how do you get that spark of whatever, creativity that gets you thinking about it? And for me, it's, it's music. Um, so early on, we went through looking through our library of stuff we had. And as weird as it sounds, I planned in my mind that when Angelica's piece comes up, if you saw the video, it's the one that starts with a train going across there. I, I knew I wanted that. I had no idea who Angelica was. I had no idea if she'd ever seen a train up close before but I knew I wanted a shot, and I'd heard a piece of song just like this one, a little different, and I said, that's it, that's it. So people sometimes say, how much of the influence of the story is you as a storyteller, how much of it comes from the people? 80% came from our people, it's their story, and about 20% is my influence, I think, just being the creative side of that. So. Any thoughts about that as far as creativity, like where it comes from, where do you go from? What do you think, Chris? Chris does some shooting too, so I'm looking at Chris here for this. So, yeah. All right, we'll come back to here in a second. So this is missing the text, but this is our slide talking about collaboration. Um, you know, at, at some point, we probably had 20 people involved with the College of Education, either helping us to do the interviews because they knew the person, helping us to come up with questions, sending us pictures, like the guy on the right there, Steve Smith. We wouldn't have had... I think the reaction um, or the, the impact of, of Chris's story if we didn't have Steve Smith in that. And the reality is in, in his series of stories, Chris actually had two different adult teachers that he talked about, but he mentioned Steve three times instead of just two. That's why Steve's story is in there. So as you guys know that do some editing, it's very easy to, to kind of be like chopping off the block here as you're cutting your paper and pretty soon you've left part of a story on the table. And so I would say for every person that's in this, you see probably at the very most one third of the stories that they told, you only see maybe one third of them. In some cases like Martin Segovia, you only see like one twentieth of what he had to share. So it's a lot. Okay. At this point, I just want to kind of take some ideas of questions, what you're interested in, because we don't have you know, a ton of time, but what would you like to learn about or what would you like to just hear our experience about? Yeah. When you filmed, did you have like one like, camera lens or there are certain lenses that you said, I want it to look this way, I want to use this lens that you said, I don't care. Yeah, so at, at the time we were changing out cameras, I had my personal camera, it looked a lot like that one right there. It's a small what they call a mirrorless camera, but it's basically like a DSLR. So it shoots video and takes still pictures. Most of the film was shot on this lens right here. And so it just has to do with how much focal length you can get with it. Um, we did a couple interviews with a different lens, but it was really just two lenses the whole way through. Okay. Good question. And of course the GoPro is really wide, so it's just whatever it gives you. Yeah. Okay. A lot of this uh, took place not on stage, you know, it was all done at their homes and stuff. So what type of lighting gear did it take? So depending on where we were at, um, we had always with us some small LED lights. Usually it was just fill light. So uh, if you guys aren't familiar with that, if you have good sunlight coming through a window, if it's bouncing through a hallway, it might illuminate the person most of the light. The fill light's just to get rid of the shadows. And so... Studio shots were all lit, but uh, almost 90% of the B-roll was all direct sunlight or, or reflected light coming off the walls and things. Um, the, the Chuck Allen shots where he turns in the story and he talks about turning the people, that was just beautiful light coming through a really old window that was glazed over with rain deposit. And so I found it, I'm like, oh my gosh, sit here, Chuck. He's like, oh. he's just like, he's in the moment right there. So sometimes you get really lucky. Any other questions? No. Yeah. I 
got too much to talk about. <laughs> All right. Let's talk briefly about interview questions then. Um, as we develop these people, as we, as we get these people's names out there, we had probably four people in our meetings that were just rattling off names saying, oh, Angelica, uh, Karina, uh, Chuck, or so-and-so. And the people that felt strongest about them, I'd say, why? How do you know them? What's their backstory? And it turns out these people knew them for years and years, and there was this specific story they wanted to have come out. So I interviewed them first to get kind of the background story, and then I called each person. Um, to be honest, Chuck Allen's was the most intimidating. The guy's like a former teacher. He's a pastor. And I'm like, hey, pastor, how you doing? Like, you know, <laughs> just kind of out of context for me. So talking to him, and we do this pre-interview. We just ask a bunch of questions about, you know, so-and-so told me about this experience. Would you mind telling me about that? And that was such a huge leap forward in, in getting past barriers because sometimes folks have got a, you know, awesome story to tell, but they're too humble, they're too quiet, they don't want to share something that personal with you, especially if they've never met you before. And so eventually, what happened is we we type up all these questions. We even type up a short bio about the person, about their background. We know they work in this beef packing plant area. There's some significance about Cargill Beef Factory. I know nothing about it, but pretty soon we start finding out details. And then we are able to begin crafting questions. And for you folks that do video stuff, you know that the worst thing you can do is ask a yes or no answer question. So it's like, so I, I hear you work at a beef packing plant. Yes. Dang it. And so and, and the more you the more you're doing that, the more you, you, you they start shutting down more and more because they're looking for you to help get the question out. And so for me, I'm not going to rattle off every one of these questions, but we try and think about them careful enough that they have to give some explanation response. You know, were you inspired to prove teachers wrong? That's a yes and no question, and sometimes it's okay to ask those, but there's, it's kind of this hint that, yeah, I was inspired to get, get back at this teacher because they, they were totally dead wrong about me, and let me tell you about it. Okay? So once we got there, the idea was we knew the questions well enough and we had 20 prepared, but really we were only going to have them answer eight. So we kind of break it down to a smaller amount. And then we just kind of open up like a conversation and say, you know, I'd love to hear about that. I've heard the story. Tell me about that. And most of our adults, they were answering a total of five questions. And that's what you saw in the film was those five answers. Yeah. I didn't get to see that film. Were there parents that were just dead set against their student No, no. Um, there's lots of little fears and concerns they have because of where they might, because of the concern of how far they travel away from home or I won't be able to help you out. But no, there wasn't uh, any real strong pushback. Yeah. Yeah. And I get the feeling that there was that they're not here because they're not here. They just wouldn't be here. Yeah, there's here and help. Yeah. Okay. This is our tech stuff, so I'll kind of cruise through this pretty fast. Um, again, something I'm trying to get better at, especially on the documentary side, because the truth is documentaries, you're shaping stuff. It's not scripted. It's not record my narration, find the B-roll, put it together. That stuff's hard, too, I'll tell you that. But when you're on the go, and some of it's like that moment where um, here we have Martin in the car. I have the the stupid camera stuck on the tripod on the window, and he's about ready to cry, and I'm like, dang it, dang it, dang it. I get off here just in time for him to say that the lady put me in her will. And you can't plan that. It just, it just happens, and so you're there to get the moment if you can. But the times where you do know the location, I try to think to myself, if it's like the library, for example, I know what that's going to look like. And so I might go over there and scope it out and say, I want to do three or four shots in a sequence that tells a visual story. And you guys know how bad that drawing is right there. But if I can tell what I'm doing with it, that's all I need to do this story here. So it's a sequence, one, two, three, four, to get the story I need to get for it. And in this particular case, this is actually the opening sequence. Um, President Schultz is talking, and there's a little B-roll where he talks about students thinking they're not smart enough. And there's a reveal shot where the camera slides past the wall, and a boy and a girl are staring at the book right there. So that was a planned shot before we got to the library but we actually broke up the sequence. So you still film it, sometimes you still break the rule with that. Okay, this sequence, we'll actually show you what this looks like in the film, although I switched up some of the shots. That top left corner there is one of our professors. He's lecturing a student. And this circle person there 
is supposed to be our, our person we're concerned about. So I was trying to think, how can I show through movement that the professor's talking to him, and there's this connection between the two of them. So it's actually in wrong order. It goes one here, two, we see a shot, a close-up shot of the student looking at the professor, nodding back and forth. Then we then go to this third shot where it, we, uh, we have the professor leaving, saying goodbye to the class, and they kind of walk away. So again, not beautiful artwork, but the idea is I want the sequence so we can feel what the student is feeling. So here it is from the video. I would say to the professors who know they have first generation students to intentionally reach out to them. Because it's already intimidating for a student to be on a college campus with a professor who has years of experience in front of them. And even when they need help, Sometimes we don't feel like we can approach them. I think it's important for them to know who those first generation students are and to intentionally go to them and say, if you need help, come to me. My advice to other teachers um, or professors that have first generation students is that they tend to see each student as an individual. Each student is there. And Okay, so that was like five shots there. And based on the storyboard, we try and get the visuals of what we want to have look for that. Okay, so any questions on that or anything? That's much more of a... Yeah, right, <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. So briefly, um, in this instance of doing this type of documentary, now that we've done this, we've done some other documentaries where it was a different style. Um, I will say this, having worked on a number of small projects, you begin to slowly build up confidence that you're gonna take off this, this big leap and take on a bigger project. It never happens, I think, confident the way you take a big, huge documentary and say, uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker here. You're, you're always trying to build small sequences. And so one way of doing this, like I've been doing for a couple of years, is to have people tell their own stories. So you interview them, they essentially narrate their storyline, you figure out what that is, you're then able to layer on the visuals that complement that, add song, add sound effects, those kind of things. Another type that you see often on the news is this idea of present tense. It's just what's happening right now in succession of time. It's not always pretty, but it's basically a chronological order of this happened here, then this happened next. And if you guys ever watch, uh, if you guys ever seen Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown, right there, um, lots of very cool different styles of how documentaries are being done today. Um, a lot of emphasis is very much on let's make it look pretty if we can, but it's a mix of let's show them on the train that's like shaking in the middle of Russia and they're all going to die somewhere, and then now they're sitting down having coffee somewhere and everything's fine. And it's just this backflash all over the place. So there's no one way of organizing a story, but it does help to kind of walk in saying I want my story to be told through the characters through the post-narration or some other process. Okay. okay, last thing I wanted to say, and maybe this is a little bit for your sake, if this is any help to you. Mm -hmm. um, as I've been working at trying to get better at, at getting an honest response, I've learned that the power of an interview will make or break a scene, period. Um, I've had people come in who have been extremely nervous, and I don't know what I did, but they'll walk away saying, you know, I felt really calm, thank you so much. I've had times where I walk in there thinking I'm just like the awesomest guy in the world, and they walk away with jitters because they're so nervous of being in front of the camera. But I've learned that it's my job to put the blame 100% on me. I've gotta be the person that says, if they walk away feeling like they can't talk, that's my problem I gotta fix. You can't ever go back and say, boy, well, that person was terrible in front of the camera. Boy, they're just, they're terrible, you know. It has to be, how can I get them to open up? And essentially what that comes down to is changing the way you do interviews. Um, the goal of an interview is not to get the responses you want. And I have to kind of fight myself of saying, wouldn't it be cool if they said, I hate McDonald's, I only love Burger King, and who can I get to say that? And saying, how can I talk to this person because I know they've got something important to say and let's just be honest and let them tell me what they have to say about it, okay? Now, can we still influence people in the conversation? If they get kind of wordy, they talk for a long time, you bet, we can still kind of curve things, but the idea is we're here to have an honest conversation, which means I'm not gonna talk for five seconds and you talk for 100% of the time, it means we're both gonna talk back and forth. 
And the more I can try and do that, um, it usually happens because we're trying to listen to what they're being, what's being said. That's a good point. Do you ever say, do you ever make any statements to them such as, you know, as you're giving me these answers, can you try and use people's names? Um, because, you know, you've got to chop it up. Mm -hmm. So if the person is always saying he, she, and you want a name, you know, so do you ever make that type of influence? Or do you sure. Think that gets a little too complicated. Sure. So we, what, we, what we try to do when there's two of us on deck, so one person's running the camera, one person actually, can actually be 100% involved, is we'll try to do that before once. And then as we're going through the interview, we'll only stop them only once and try and give that, that instruction again. So if, they still like, if they're still off, I found that if you keep on trying to stop them, it will just shut them down yeah. to where they won't talk. And I've been surprised. The more I, I try and make it focused on this is a conversation, and the way I let them know it's a conversation is I'll actually stop them like, seriously, that really happened to you? Oh, tell me about that. Then they realize, oh, he's going to ask me more stuff. And pretty soon I can guide it through a conversation. Um, yeah. Two years ago I was terrible. I would say terrible at doing interviews. Well, I, I mean, that, uh, you're totally right. I mean, that's been the biggest thing we've run into. And, and, you know, and especially in trying to train someone else to do what I do. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get them to understand there's a whole psychology going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about you have to be this very nice guy, even if you're not. You need to be a very nice guy because you're trying to instantly build a relationship with them mm -hmm. right then, 10 minutes before you want to interview them. So, yeah. When, when I taught public schools for a number of years, I, my big lesson I always gave the speech students was you have to believe. No matter how much you hate this, no matter if you hate my class, me, whatever like that, you have to believe when you get up there that what you have to say is worth something. And if you don't, then don't get up. So I try, I try to give that little pep talk to everybody. Um, a couple years ago, we had Tom Vance had three very well-known authors, very high political figures from Indiana State, Boston College, other places come. One guy was absolutely petrified because he'd been on the news, and they attacked him, just destroyed him in front of the camera. So he was literally nervous of being anywhere in proximity. So we tried doing things like, here's the camera and getting way off axis. So I'm over here talking this way, almost to like a side profile shot so he doesn't have to see the lens. And even then, I had, I had to coach a 78-year-old man and say, dude, I know you're smart. I'm not that smart. I'd love to hear what you have to say about politics because I've heard incredible things about you. And I wasn't lying. I wasn't being just, you know, unsincere, but I had to tell them that you've got something worth saying, and I want to hear all about it. And once it was done, he calmed down, he was all fine, but it, it is the biggest struggle, I think, in that. So, okay. How do you go about wrangling their answers into shorter bits that you'd be able to use? So occasionally, occasionally, they'll say something that's this profound story that comes out after this long, convoluted start structure. So I can't have them retell a personal story again, but I can say, you know what? That was so cool, that was great. Would you mind saying that again? And let's try to bring it all together in a shorter statement. And if I do that just once or twice in the interview, they're willing to do that. What I, I can't have them do is, is bleed all over the floor for the second time. So if they, I'm being joking here, but if they, if they open up and really tell you a heartfelt story, you, you can't ask them to do that again. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, when we've done that, I always blame myself. So say there's something wrong with the camera, we need, we, need, we need a different shot, or we want to change the audio, so the blame is on me, could you go through this, could mm -hmm. you answer this again? And that works too, because we've honestly had batteries die halfway through a story. And so you don't stop them right there, but you're like, you know what, thank you so much, I'm so sorry. Could we do that again from, yeah. It's a good cover, Never mind. <laughs> okay. All right, well, almost done here. So again, this is for those who've talked about because they're interested in doing documentaries or doing stuff like that. The, the mechanics of an interview is, is pretty simple in some ways. Let's assume you have one camera set up here, and if I was talking with you here, Catherine, in the perfect world, you'd have someone else running the equipment so you're not worried about it. But if I'm interviewing you, it's just you and me talking right here. I'm close to proximity of the camera, and depending on the look you want, some people want to have them looking right at the camera, but 90% of the time it's what we call off-axis, where I'm off to the side of the camera, you're not looking right at the lens, and as we're talking back and forth, this setup here gives us the angle like Chuck has right here. He should be, if he was talking to me, he'd be looking right at me this way, but he's looking over here at David Griffin, and we're about this far apart. So, and you guys know when you're in really tight spaces, sometimes it's really hard. Lots of times we're doing interviews by ourselves, and so I'm like this where I pull up a chair, 
Okay, and feel free to jump in here, guys, with this. But to get the to get it to look right, we're the same high height as each other right here. The camera is the same eye height, plus or minus a little bit, depending on the look you want. And the idea is my camera would be like right next to me here. So as we're talking, it's going past me and getting the person here for the shot. But the mechanics is, you've set up your audio, you've set up your lighting, you've already pre-tested that if you're lucky. But if you had to and you're in this really confined space, they're not looking at the lens, they're looking at you through that. Okay. Sometimes because of the types of cameras we use, I'm sitting here and the camera guy's way past me so that we can zoom in there nice and close and they, don't, they have no idea that the camera's like this close on their head, like that, okay? Lots more to that as far as how we set up the audio and things, but the mechanics is pretty simple. You get them in a comfortable spot. The interviewer is the same height as the person. Otherwise, if I'm up here like this, they look small. If I'm way down here, you're, you're seeing the nasal holes and that's not pretty on anybody. So that's what you're trying to do with that, okay? Do you have any questions? When it sounds good, we're using a boom mic. When it's <laughs> no, most of the time we try to have a shotgun mic set up in the room if we could. Anytime we use, you see lighting, it's, we've used a shotgun mic. But almost all the car travel stuff is a wireless mic for that. Yeah. Okay. Last two things will be done here. So, editing a story. When you've got something that's this big, 16 hours of interviews, and you start off by saying, how in the hay am I going to get this cut down to here? I went back to school back and said, I'm going to use a word map, spider map here. So here's Helen's story. I sit down one day in one sitting. I'll listen to an hour of her interview, and I just write everything I hear her talk about. I'll just scribble it down on paper. If I can do it while it's happening here, great. If I can't, I'll then go back and say what were her main subtopics. Just like a speech or a five paragraph essay, I'll say what's the main point, what's the big story, what are these subtopics, and then I'll actually put it away for a couple days, and I'll come back and I'll say, you know what, I'm gonna watch it a second time, and this time, these are the stories that really stick out to me, and I begin highlighting again. But this is what helps me narrow down, instead of telling a story just about her ESL experience, which was terrible, or just about her siblings, or just about her struggles in college, we begin to narrow down to maybe five talking points for that person. And you just say what's most important. You begin to pull it back, pull it back. And even a five minute interview on a single person, same thing, you, you talk to them for that 45 minutes, that 20 minute interview, and you say what's the most important thing that they've got to tell us, and what has to be there. Then, if you can imagine eight more of these up there on the wall for each person, you look back and see where are my duplicates. So if I see that Martin and Chuck both say the exact same thing about their high school principal, well, maybe one of them gets to tell that story. I'm going to go back and find the other really cool story that only they've talked about. If that makes sense. So this sounds really easy right now, but this was a six-month process of getting the stories, playing them back, finding out what's the most important part, and then whittling it down. Okay. Eventually, after doing all of our editing, we began to organize it by themes. And we basically said, who's going to talk about this so that we could put our chapters together. And that's kind of how I think about this documentary. It's eight chapters, well, really three, but eight, eight individuals. Two of them talk about how their faith and or their family supported them. Some of them only talk about one thing, like paying it forward. And there was lots of people that told stories about it. But we decided that Martin Segovia, he gets to be the pay it forward stories. Um, Chuck Allen, he could have been an hour-long documentary. Um, I've, I've never, ever met a person that was that fluent on camera in my life. Um, you guys that have seen timelines, when I edited his timeline, the first three minutes he speaks, there's five total cuts. He's that good, you know? Other people, I'm like Frankensteining these sentences together. Oh, I think I love school. It's just like, <laughs> seriously, to get, to get a coherent short statement. But I could have gone forever because it was so fun and so easy to cut his piece. Um, and you just don't get that very often. Okay. I was wondering that, uh, and I did, I'm sorry, I didn't see the documentary either, but the uh, story that the guy was telling in the car about how he um, used to work on that guy's lawn mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, was that Frankenstein at all, or was that just... That's one piece. That's no edit at all, yeah. Yeah, and that, and that didn't make it in the film, because he had... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had, we had eight stories. It, it, literally, everywhere we drove, that guy taught me how to box. And he did this and this and this. That guy was the tackle shop. And it was just like, I, I couldn't stop the camera for four hours. It was just nonstop stories like that. So. Okay, again, 
just for the sake of editing, just showing how this looks. The, the, the long process of this, of, of basically how we tackle the footage, we put it on paper first saying here's the points we want to make, and then I do something called tagging. Some people call it logging, but that's different means. What I do is I put a text bar across the top of that entire interview, and I just begin changing the text over the talking points. So this is... Different project, but this is an hour of editing or tagging in about one minute. And all we're doing is I'm just literally adding text, text, text over the top. And then anything that's just dead space, completely unusable, I just chop it out and throw it away and begin to consolidate it down. A new timeline for each person. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, editing. I know this is kind of a how you make a documentary kind of thing, but. Uh, Lucy, can you tell us about the funding for this project? Is it just the department paid for it? Or it was the dean. It was the dean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, all I can tell you is I can tell you how many hours we spent on it like that, but within the College of Education, uh, everyone is billed for what we do. We have an hourly rate for that, but 90% of our projects right now are funded from the dean. So we have in this project around 250 hours on this particular project, and uh, probably 180 of that's editing hours. I mean, to me, I mean, I'm not being critical because no. I loved what you did. I'm not being critical, but to me, a lot of the scenes were, you know, looking at an empty schoolyard in an empty church, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I didn't see a lot of the, the people that were having stories told um, interacting. Was, mm -hmm. that, was that on purpose or? Uh, I would say only a small amount was on purpose. Um, the school that Chuck went to where we filmed it, that place had been closed for 10 years. And so we happened to find the guys who owned it and they opened it up for us for the day. So it worked well for the solitude and the feeling of it, but certainly there was a feeling of down, despair, at times where we weren't really expecting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Mostly in country. Was it, because it was in the summer, is that why? It, it, it was a town of 400 people, so there's like nobody there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was actually, there was teachers in the building, but because we got permission that day to film in the school, I didn't want to yeah. have other teachers there. And I do think yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of shoulda, wouldas. We could have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it's hard getting all that plan, you know, especially when you're going to all these locations. Yeah. 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 Well, folks, thanks for your coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.